play with Ricky. No, pray for him. Pray for him. Uh, Amen. Yeah. Well, let's do that. <laughs> Is Brother Ricky sick? Yeah. yeah. Let's, let's pray. Right where we're standing. Amen. Lord, as we come to you in the name of Jesus, Lord, we thank you for Brandon sharing this prayer request. Lord, our dear brother Ricky, I pray that you touch him physically, spiritually. Lord, that you'd encourage him. Lord, I pray that if there's sickness in his body, Lord, that you would bring your healing virtue. Lord, we thank you in advance for all that you've done and all that you're going to do. Lord, we call it done in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. That's what we're going to sing about right now, just what he just did. The song just simply says, take it to God. Bring that down to some brother. Take it to God in prayer. Listen to the words. I see that sad, sad look in your eyes. I can't help but notice how you keep it locked inside. When you face a trial, you bear your burdens all along. Let me remind you, there's peace at the Savior's throne. He's gonna open the window 
and pour you out a blessing. It's your season to be blessed. It's your season to be blessed. Amen. God made you a promise and you stood the test. The winds of heaven they pour you out a blessing. It's your season yeah, to be blessed. Listen. I'm blessed in the city, I'm blessed in the field, I'm blessed going out, I'm blessed coming in. He's going to open the windows and pour you out a blessing, it's your season to be blessed, help me sing now, it's your season to be blessed, to be blessed. God you a promise and you stood, you stood the test. He will open the windows the windows of heaven. God's going to pour, pour you out a blessing. It's your season, it's your season to be blessed. I'm blessed in the fire and I'm blessed in the blood, but I'm standing right here. He's gonna open the windows. He will pour you out a blessing. It's your season, hey, to be blessed. Help me sing now. It's your season to be blessed. To be blessed. God made you promise. I gave you a promise. And you stood. He's gonna open the windows. It's your season, 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 it's
But let me tell you what, David felt the same way when he looked at that big Goliath. But you know what? He was surrounded by God who was much bigger than any giant that you and I would ever face. So it was a very simple song, but it's a true song. So I want you to catch on to it and help me sing this song. This is how I fight my battles with my hands lifted up. Amen. This is how I fight my battles by singing some hallelujahs. Amen. This is how I fight my battles on my knees in prayer. This is how I fight my battles with my sword in my hand. Amen. Listen. Torn and torn 
I said, I know how it is when you're a preacher. You want to preach it all. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. You want to preach it all. But we do honor Sister Tammy, and I'm so glad you're feeling better in your beautiful family. I'm glad you're here tonight. I heard you were sick, too. Bless your heart. And Pastor and everyone else that's been going through all this. We're certainly praying for Brother Ricky as well. Uh, back at the table, just come back and make sure you shake our hands. We still have a few shirts left. We um, had to, uh, something new. We had run out, and we had some more to come in. This is one of those, it's like a Yeti type thing. It says, God is good all the time. Put your hot stuff in and your cold stuff. Michael loves them because he is a coffee addict. <laughs> Y'all pray for him. <laughs> and then Christmas is right around the bend. And this is where we recorded him dressed up as his Christian comedy character, Deacon Cornbread. And it was filmed at our church. And you can see it pretty good. But we, we, it was just such a funny thing. Sometimes when I get down and he's not even home, I'll just put this in and just laugh my head off. And the thing that scares me is he's so comfortable with this character. <laughs> Pastor, I just say, don't get mixed up. I do not want to wake up in the morning and see this character <laughs> next to me. <laughs> but it's yeah. just, you know, the, the word says laughter is good for the soul. Amen. And uh, we need to laugh sometime. And so they, we have those back there. Same price as the CDs. Just come by and let us know you're praying for us. And uh, if you need any of those items, that will certainly help our ministry. Father, we thank you for tonight. I thank you, Lord, for the piano player. We thank you, God, for sending him to this church and just making that piano just ring. And we just thank you for that. We thank you for the sound man, God, for keeping us sounding good and, and doing his part. And Father, we thank you for the ushers and the choir singers and and everyone, God, has got a part in this church alongside Pastor and Sister Tammy. Uh, Father, we just thank you for that. We ask you, God, to take us to that place, Lord, where we can receive what we need tonight. Lord, we don't want to be distracted by time. We, won't, don't, we don't want to be distracted by our cell phones or anything like that, God. But let us focus on you. If we do that, we'll be like Peter and we'll walk on the water in the mess of our lives, in the storms of our lives. We'll give you the praise for it all. And everyone said together, Amen. 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 the man of God. Let the church say amen. amen. When she gets to introducing, I really get concerned. I don't know what she's going to say. And uh, uh, she, when, when you heard me cut her off, don't think that she was about to tell some deep, dark secret. Uh, I was just afraid Brother Darren was air, uh, broadcasting this on Facebook Live. And uh, it's just some matters I didn't want to make public yet. I'll tell you about it after service. Uh, probably somebody's thinking, Brother Mike is in the witness protection plan. <laughs> I, I am. I, I'm a witness for the Lord and his angels yeah. are protecting yeah. me. Hallelujah. I have a, I feel like it's a unique word from God. As much as I love to try to sing, and I, I choose that word carefully because you've got to understand, in my ministry I've spent the last 30 years singing beside somebody that sings like her and somebody that sings like my daughter Brooke. So I can get to feel real insignificant really quick. But uh, I just thank God they use their talents for his glory. But uh, first and foremost, God has called me to preach his gospel. And the gospel will break chains and set the captive free. Uh, as I mentioned last night, that word, and let, let me give you our scripture reference tonight so you can be turning while I'm making these comments. We're going to be reading out of the Gospel of Luke, chapter 16. We'll begin reading at verse 19, uh, perhaps to some of us a very familiar passage of scripture. Luke 16 and verse 19. But that word last night, the Lord, uh, Pastor Eddie, I'm sure you can identify in your many years of ministry, but sometimes God will speak a word to you before he can speak it through you. And uh, I think we all have had storms, but there's only two elements in that storm. And I'm not trying to re-preach the message from last night, but he went in with a promise and he came out with a song in his heart. And we sang that last night. This is my story. This is my song. Brother Jack, I'm praising my Savior all the day long. Yes. If you're able to stand with us for the reading of the Word of God, would you do so? 
And if you found Luke 16 and 19, which is say, I've got it. I got it. Verse 19, red letter edition. This is indicating to us that this is the Lord Jesus Christ speaking. Now, when you and I talk, we, we might talk about the weather. We might talk about, well, uh, uh, Pastor Eddie's been sick. His son, Justin, has gotten sick. Uh, Brother Ricky is, is not feeling well. And, and, and we talk. But everything that Jesus said was of utmost importance. So I, I wanted to preface that before we read this red letter edition. This is the boss talking. On your job, when it's your boss, when it's your supervisor, you pay close attention. Verse 19, it reads, There was a certain rich man, which was clothed in purple and fine linen, and fared sumptuously every day. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus, which was laid at the gate full of sores. And desiring to be fed with the crumbs, hear this, which fell from the rich man's table, moreover the dogs came and licked his sores. And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom, representing heavenly places. The rich man also died, but notice how it described his after-death experience. The rich man died and was buried. And then we read in verse 23, And in hell. The Bible clearly describes, and I won't ask you to turn to that, that scripture, but it is appointed unto man once to die after this, the judgment. Let's pick back up on verse 23. And in hell... He, the rich man, lifted up his eyes, being in torment, and seeth at Abraham afar off, and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me. And we're going to pause right there. This is perhaps... It's a very unusual message. Many times when we preach a message regarding the, the fiery hell, the torments of hell, many times the lost, the unsaved, they will pay close attention as they should. And that is my intent here tonight. But even more importantly or just as important, I want you, the church, to pay attention. To grasp at every word somebody's thinking, but Brother Mills, I'm already saved. Having said that, I want to title this message tonight, Seven Things in Hell That the Church Needs. May we bow our heads and go to our Heavenly Father in prayer. Brother Linwood, once again, would you lead us in prayer tonight? Thank you, God. Find that word with authority and power, God. Let the anointing of the Holy Spirit be upon him in a, holy, in a mighty way, God, that we might receive your word and go forth, God, and be that you call us to be in the heavy yes. way in the search. Yes. All of us are conscious here tonight, God, we give your name honor and praise and glory in Jesus' name. We ask. Jesus. Amen. 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 Turn around, shake somebody's hand. Quote that verse that we said last night, for I believe God. Tell somebody that. For I believe God. And you make me see that. Amen. Once again, we're delighted to have visitors here with us tonight. Uh, once again, our, our, our friends, uh, we met last week while we were in revival over in Stedman. Uh, uh, Brother Ralph, Sister Jean, God bless you. Thank you all for coming tonight. Uh, our new friend, Sister Kathy Ammons, God bless you. Thank you for, for being here tonight. Any other visitors that we have in the house of God? Amen. Is that Sister Alice back there? 
Sister Rosie, God bless you. Thank you for coming. We share a mutual friend. Uh, she was telling us about a, a dear friend over at a church we've held revival at years back. So good to reacquaint with you again, Sister Rosie. For the next few moments, I'd like to speak to you, as I said on the outset, seven things in hell that the church needs. Brother Mills, have you lost your mind? Let's find out what the Word of God says. It's red letter edition. is the Lord Jesus Christ speaking. Let's go back to be the beginning. There was a certain rich man. If you notice, when I read verse 19, I emphasized the word. There was a certain rich man. There have been some that tried to proclaim that the, this account that we read about Lazarus and the rich man was perhaps a parable, a, 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 a comparative a story, but everything that Jesus Christ said was true. And he says right here, there was a certain rich man. He didn't say, let's imagine if there was a certain rich man, but there was a rich man which was clothed in purple. May I insert right here, purple in the day of our reading, our text here, purple uh, was a color that was usually worn by royalty. It denoted that a man was of wealth, of means, of certain status. And this same verse 19 says, and he fared sumptuously every day. That tells me, Brother Linwood, that this rich man, uh, he didn't clip, he didn't clip coupons on double coupon day on Wednesday. He didn't go down to Piggly Wiggly with his bumper sticker that said, I'm sticking with the pig. He had the means. And the, the Bible says he fared sumptuously every day. And then verse 20 says, And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus, which was laid at the gate. Understand this. Lazarus, you must... You must also know that in the time of our reading, they didn't have welfare, they didn't have social programs, they didn't have a, a, a county assistance, but a, a, a person that was handicapped, a person that couldn't work, they had to beg. And in his case, if he wasn't able to move about on his own legs, he had to hope somebody would pick him up and carry him to perhaps an entrance of the gate of the temple. Brother Nathan hoping you would walk by and drop something into his cup that he could still eke out his meager existence. Well, this beggar named Lazarus was laid at the gate, and the Bible gives us a description, full of of sores. It's not uh, clear to us at this point whether he's in the early stages of leprosy. Leprosy is a disease that starts out as a small spot, an impurity, and before you know it, it has engulfed the entire body. Extremities have been known to fall off. Well, this is said right here. He's full of sores. 21. And desiring to be fed with the crumbs. Not the T-bone steak. Not the buffet meal. He just wanted what you were about to throw away. The crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. That was his only means of comfort. If you recall when I described to you on Sunday night of my missions trip to Ecuador and how they don't have very much of a, a health care system in that poverty-stricken country. But uh, as, as impoverished as that is, they don't let their sick people lay in the streets waiting for the dogs to lick them. This beggar was in a predicament. But it says here, it came to pass, 22, that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. Now here is where I pick this up. Uh, you, you understand that the angels do not carry people to their graves. But they carried him to Father Abraham's bosom or, or to paradise. According to Luke chapter 23 and verse 43, uh, Bible scholars tell us that this is... 
located in the lower part of the earth. And that's where many believe that the saints of God was held until after the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ when he had power over death, hell, and the grave. Can somebody say amen? Somebody say he is risen. The grave is empty. He is risen. But here is where I want to get your attention. Seven things in hell that the church needs. Verse 23. And in hell. Hades. Sheol according to the, the Hebrew. Hades according to the Greek. The unseen world of departed spirits. And in hell. He the rich man lifted up his eyes. Number one. What the church needs that's in hell in this story is sight. If you're taking notes, my friend, you need to write this down because the Bible tells us with no vision, the people perish. I've seen churches that have only tunnel vision. As long as it's me and my wife, my brother and his wife, us four, no more, amen. But I'm telling you, you and I need to have a burden, a passion to win lost souls to the kingdom of God. Can you give our Lord a hand of praise for that? He lifted up his eyes, being in torments, and the Bible declares that he sees. Father Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. Can you imagine how that added to the torments of the rich man? A man that he had scorned. A man that he wouldn't even allow his servants to rake the crumbs to feed this beggar. And now this lowly beggar is in paradise, in heavenly places. And now all he can do is see it. It reminds me of when I was a little boy and my brother who is two years older than me and a hundred pounds larger than me. When we would fight like brothers always fight and I was the baby. Amen. Something about the baby. Amen. Brother Nathan is something about the baby that touches mama's heart. But you weren't, well, brother, welcome to my world. <laughs> Because my brother would pick at me, but until finally, Mama made him sit down and have a timeout. Now, we didn't have timeout like most folks had timeout. Timeout was when Daddy took timeout to wear your britches out. Amen, brother. Amen, brother. After he's recovering from a timeout, he sees me. And mama giving me chocolate cake. <laughs> Can you imagine how it added? Now, now, mama wasn't playing favorites. He truly mistreated me. He truly done wrong. But imagine how somebody that, that, that you had all against, you had ill against, and now you've got to watch them being rewarded. Wow. That's why the Bible says, there, pre Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Yeah. You may talk about me, you may scandalize my name, but one day the Lord God himself is going to prepare a table and I'm going to sit at the table next to the king and you can't do anything but grieve over it. So don't you worry about those that talk about the way you worship. Don't you worry about those that talk about uh, that you go to church all the time because one day God is going to set that table and all they can do is watch you receive your rewards. Things in hell that the church needs. Secondly, as we read further here, and he cried, verse 24, and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus. Number two, things in hell that the church needs. We need to cry. I don't mean just for the sake of emotional tears. But a crying in the sense of not only crying from a broken and a contrite spirit. But also to cry out as if to project our voice. So the Bible declares according to Isaiah. Cry loud and spare not. We've got too many women, men and women, Brother Ralph, that they 
are ashamed of their testimony. We got too many folks that want to be a secret agent Christian. This may be in hell right now, but we can learn from uh, this is too late for the rich man, but he cried. I want to be a part of a church that cries out the good news of Jesus Christ. I want to be a part of a church uh, that is not just satisfied for what we used to do, but we're crying out for God to send the increase. That we have a vision. Can you give our God a hand of praise? Hallelujah. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me. And see Lazarus, that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue. For I am tormented in this flame. Also here in verse 24, we find the third thing in hell that the church needs. When was the last time that you truly thirsted? For a move of God. I'm not talking about you came out to revival because everybody was expecting. But you came out because you wanted an encounter with God. Brother Linwood, we came because I literally, Lord, I thirst. I must have a word from God. I must have an encounter with God. I remember on my first visit here with you several years back. I told you as a child I, uh, of my experience in picking cotton. One day, one day I picked cotton my first and my last. And on that, that hot day, I was so thirsty. I knew I was going to make hundreds of dollars. Uh, Brother Linwood, that night before I got the Sears catalog out, the wish book, and, and I was just picking out all the things I was going to get. But when lunchtime came around, I was so parched and thirsty that I advanced. Uh, I, I said, I need a dollar. I need an advance so I can buy that 16-ounce Pepsi. Anybody remember when they made it in the 16-ounce bottle? Boy, uh, Brother Ralph, a 16-ounce Pepsi, and back then, a, uh, and a moon pie. Anybody remember that? Well, that would bless you back then, wouldn't it? But I was thirsty. Now, I thought I was going to make oodles of money, but after I bought that dollar to, to uh, buy that 16-ounce Pepsi in the moon pie, after I earned what I picked that day, I ended up owing them money. <laughs> <laughs> but when we hunger, when we thirst for more of God, but Brother Eddie, he won't charge us for it. Uh, he pours his spirit. He said, blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after my righteousness for they might. Brother Nathan, he said, for they shall be filled. Let's move on down to verse 25. Do you have that verse there for me, honey? thing in hell that the church needs. And we've already talked about we need sight. We need to, to have the ability to cry out and proclaim his word. We need to thirst for a move of God. But fourthly, we read here, she read here in verse 25. He said, remember, I believe those that are tormented in the flames of hell, one of their greatest torments will be the ability to remember. Brother Jack, I'm convinced that what will be uh, as much of a torment as the, as the flame that dieth not, Brother Linwood, will also be the memory of lost opportunities. Amen. That they will think on, on November the 19th, 2019, at Shiloh Pentecostal Holiness Church on Autry Mill Road, uh, uh, I had an opportunity to make things right with God. Amen. But I was afraid that somebody would see me go to the altar and wonder, what is he going to the altar? That's going to haunt you throughout all of eternity. Amen. 
if we die in an unrepented condition. I believe also this thing in hell that the church needs memory. I'm glad that God doesn't remember the man or woman that we used to be. Our sins are cast into the sea of forgetfulness. Sister Wendy, never to be remembered again. But I believe those that are tormented in the flame, they will have full re recognition, full memory of missed opportunities. Let's move to verse 26. Would you read that for me, honey? And beside all things, between us and you, there is a great gulf fixed, so that they which would pass from hence to you cannot, neither can they pass to us and would come from this. Now let me just insert right here. Besides all this, he tells them, between you and us, there's a great gulf, a great divide. God in his infinite wisdom, he knew that Father Abraham would see those that, that were tormented in the flames. He might would have a, a compassion on them, but see, God has compassion, but he is also a God of judgment. It's not God that condemns us to hell. It's our decision to disobey his word that sends us to hell. It's our decision not to accept Jesus Christ as our Savior that sends us to hell. So he said, it's a great divide. You can't go there and they can't come here once you close your eyes in eternity. Now read verse 27 for me. Verse 27, we read it right there, that, that fifth verse, he, that fifth word, he said, then he said, I pray. Yeah. It's in hell. He's in hell, but he's praying. My uncle used to have a saying, he, he said, prayer meeting in hell is too late. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Somehow, if we could lift off the roof of hell and listen in to the weeping, wailing, gnashing of teeth, uh, tormented in the flame, we would hear some mighty prayers right. yes. being screamed. Yes. 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 But for the rich man, it's eternally too late. Yes. But my brother, my sister, if you don't hear another word that I say tonight, understand, while you've got breath in your body, Pray, call on him, beseech him, uh, uh, turn aside from your wicked ways and say, God, it's me standing in the need of prayer. I'm not pointing a finger at him or her. Lord God, it's me standing in the need of prayer. The church needs to be a praying church. I've heard some preachers say, oh, I, I, I wish I had a choir that could sing like Brooklyn Tabernacle Choir. I, I wish I could sing like this or that. It's okay to have a singing church, but I would much rather have a praying church. Amen. 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 Yes. Yes. Glory to God and bless his name. Can somebody say amen? amen. amen. Read that verse 28 for me, honey. Here is the sixth thing in hell. He's only been in hell a short while. And revival is about to break out. I don't say that loosely. I don't say it callously. I just say it. Look how just a few seconds in an eternal hell it changed. That hard-hearted rich man. What is this sixth thing in hell that we the church could learn from? Concern, passion. Yeah. He's only been there a moment and now he has a missionary burden. Yeah. He said, Lord, I've got five brethren. No doubt they're just as ruthless and hard-headed as the rich man himself. Yes. He says, would you, would you resurrect Lazarus from the grave? Let him walk among them. Let him be that fiery evangelist returned from the grave. Yes. You know how some churches, they want that super duper turbo. 
whatever's trending in the church. Y'all heard me say it before, everything that glitters is not gold. That's right. That's right. That's right. So if, it, if it's not in line with the word of God, you, you should be weary of it. That's right. That's right. So he's got this compassion. He's got this, this, this burden. I have five brethren. Yes. What we can learn from that. Like this rich man, we've got lost loved ones. You, you'll hear me mention it every night of this revival in our time of prayer. We have lost loved ones. As much as I love to worship God, I love to praise Him. I love to sing about His goodness. In the back of my mind, I might be sitting on this pew. Pastor Eddie may be preaching a powerful word of God, but deep back in my mind, I'm thinking of my nephews. If they don't repent and give their heart to Jesus, I'm thinking about sisters of mine that grew up in church. So, so I have that concern. Yes. yes. And chances are, yes. you do too. Yes. I don't want to be a satisfied church. Yes. I want to be a church that has a burden for lost souls. Yes. Just because God has blessed you all with this beautiful building next door and, and I can't wait to see the pictures when you christen the building and, and, and have a Holy Ghost move of God in there. As wonderful as that is, do not do not lose your passion to win lost souls. You may have it fully paid for the day you open the door and have that first service. God bless your heart, but don't let that cause you to lose passion for winning lost souls. That is job priority one of the New Testament church. Would you say amen? Amen. Seven. We'll find here in verse 29 and 30. Would you read that for me? Abraham saith unto him, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. And he said, Nay, Father Abraham. But if one went unto them from the dead, they will repent. Read 31. And he said unto them, If they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. Seven thing in hell that I glean that you and I as the church, we find right here in verse 30. And he said, Nay, Father Abraham, but if one went from the dead, they would repent. There's that word, repent. Yeah. Oh, the church, we hear many confessions, but it's entirely different than repenting. Yes. Yes. You've heard me say before, yes. in the Shepson County Courthouse, day after day, you have guilty criminals that confess to the crime. Brother Linwood, they might plea bargain to a lesser deal, do a little dealing with the judge, with the uh, uh, attorneys behind the... Uh, but, but that's not true repentance. Oh, okay. Confession is a brother Nathan, I did it. But if I had the opportunity, I'd do it again. I'm, I'm not repentant, have I? Repentant is not only have I acknowledged my wrong, but repent means I have decided to move and turn away from my ways of sin. Amen. That I have vowed unto God, I, I leave this sin. Yes. That's why the Lord told the woman caught in the act of adultery, go and sin no more. That's right. That's right. That's right. There was a rich man clothed in purple and fine linen, and fared sumptuously every day. There was a certain beggar named Lazarus, which was laid at his gate full of sores, and desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. It came to pass that the beggar died, was carried by the angels to Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died. And that's when we glean. We get a, 
In the New Testament, we, we get our first glimpse of the torments of hell. There's screaming. There's weeping. There's wailing. There's vision. There's sight. There's vision. There's crying. Well, the church needs to learn to cry. Sometimes a good old cry will do you good. Amen. Uh, uh, have you ever been so emotionally bottled up? You, you, all of a sudden, it just hits you all at once. And you just cry. You, you can't help it. When my mother died, I'm not one that usually cries. I very seldom cry. Jamil will tell you that. She smacks me around. I don't cry. <laughs> <laughs> but on a serious note, all after she passed away, all during the visitation, all during the memorial service, all during all of the out-of-town, out-of-state visitors, we're hugging, we're greeting them, and, and me uh, helping to coordinate the business affairs of my family, me trying to referee my family. Y'all don't have family like that. I understand. It's different in Sepson County. I understand. But after the funeral, we go back home. All the well-wishers, all the visitors are gone. Brother Nathan, say it again. Then it hit me. I sat there on the couch. And Brother Lynn, when all of a sudden I started heaving. And I cried. And I cried. I, I told Jamil to, to, to send Mikey and Leah to the room. for. I, I didn't want them to see me crying. And, and she said, honey. You need to mourn for your mother. You've been trying to be strong for everybody else, and we all gathered together. My children, my wife, prayed for me, and I cried a good cry. And you know what? After that, Pastor, I felt so good. It didn't bring my mother back, but it resolved hurts, longings, missings. I, I knew she'd go on to be with the Lord. The reason I said all of that is to tell you this. You might not have to come down to this altar and ask God to forgive you because you got drunk last week. I hope that's not the case. Or that you committed some hideous crime. I hope that's not the case. But I do invite you to come to this altar because every once in a while, uh, you like myself, we just need to get on our knees before God and have a good cry and say, Lord, I just need you. Everything that's in me that's lacking, would you fill it? Fill every crack, fill every crevice with your spirit. And I cried, and I cried. So we, we read in hell the church needs sight. We read in church and in hell that the, the church needed to cry, and we needed uh, the thirst. As I read there when he said, send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger. In water, he's thirsty. We read where there's memory of lost opportunities. We read that I pray thee, the church needs to be a praying church. We need to have compassion and concern. And lastly, if not most importantly, we need to repent. Amen. 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 I, I got to say it again. We need to repent. Wait a minute, Brother Mills. I, I'm saved. I, I, I've been a, an usher in the church for 10 years. I, I, I've been a choir member for 15 years. God bless you. But when you leave those double doors, there's a devil out there trying to trip you up. Trying to cause you to stumble. If, 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 I, if I act in a way I shouldn't act, if I say it in a manner I shouldn't say, I need to come before God. I need to repent. And say, Lord, renew my strength and restore my joy. Take not your Holy Spirit from me, as Psalmist, uh, as David the Psalmist said. I'm going to ask my wife to make her way to the piano. There 
is an appointment that we're going to have to keep. According to Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 27, and as it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this, the judgment. That's an appointment we're going to have to keep. My question on this revival night, are you ready for that appointment? Are you ready for that appointment? Years ago, before I was in the ministry, I used to be in an, an accountant. I was a tax specialist. I would have business owners and some would bring very detailed records to me. They've been preparing for their appointment with their tax man. I'd have some, Brother Linwood, they just step out of the car. They might have a trunk full of receipts. They weren't ready. They, they weren't ready. Some were already getting letters from the IRS. They'd avoided, avoided, avoided their obligation. That, uh, and they weren't ready for that appointment. Now, I'm not here to preach on death and taxes, but there's an appointment you need to be ready for. Amen. It is appointed unto man once to die. I want to be ready. Yes. I want to be ready. Yes. And if getting ready means you're going to look at me funny when I go to the altar, I can't help that. Right. I want to be ready. Right about now, nothing convict, can convince this rich man that that should have been the most important thing on his priority. Amen. All the wealth, all the land, all the valuables he possessed, it paled in comparison if he had only one minute of the opportunity. Every head bowed, every eye closed, what you see.
I don't care if you jump. I don't care if you shout. But I do hope you listen. I don't want to stand before God. I don't want the Holy Spirit to convict me and, and, and say, Oh, you got him to shout it and run in the aisles. But did you really lead, lead them to an altar of repentance? So, folks... Hear my heart when I say I don't want to get caught up in the emotion, emotion and miss what God really wants to do. You might be a veteran of the church. When I say about that, you've been faithful to the church for many, many years. But if you want to make sure that you're ready, if these seven things in hell that the church needs, if, if you want God to write them on your heart, you want to know that you're ready. If I were you, I would come to this altar. If I were you, I would find a place at this altar. And like the rich man, I'd call out the names of my 